Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas Salmond. I am the director for the Center for the Study of the United States. Welcome to Defunding the Police, Rethinking Public Safety so that Black Lives Matter. I'm going to speak very, very briefly before turning uh, uh, the camera over to Professor Max Mischler, who will introduce the panelists for today. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank the panelists in particular, but everyone who showed up today. This is a matter that is of vital importance to all of us. I'm going to try to keep my comments very brief to leave more time for people to speak. Um, I will say that I wish we all were in a room together, face to face, speaking. Uh, this is a poor substitute for real colloquy, but we're going to do the best we can under the circumstances. Um, at the last event that we did, uh, in what I hope will be a long series of events, uh, which was a student facing uh, uh, discussion about rebellion, uh, I read the uh, Center for the Study of the United States statement on Black Lives Matter. I will skip that today. I'd ask you to, if you haven't read it, to go to the website and read it. And if you have feedback, please to send that to me directly. Um, I, uh, I, I want to say very briefly um, that my role in this will be simply to moderate. Uh, I will take the questions and uh, give them to the panelists as, uh, as necessary. Uh, and uh, you can see there on the screen, um, please use the Zoom built-in Q&A feature or email us at csus at utoronto.ca and the questions will be relayed to me. Um, I hope that we can have a, a meaningful discussion uh, around this issue. Um, and I wanna make very clear that if, if your questions or your comments don't make it into the conversation today, we have every intention of having at least several more of these because the reason we posted that statement was to begin a process, not to end it. Where other organizations have begun and ended with a statement on Black Lives Matter, we feel that uh, a set of discussions and then moving into questions of practice is the way that actually makes some sense in dealing with a crisis that unfortunately spans generations. And so today we're going to discuss defunding the police and in weeks to come we'll take up other matters around the question of Black Lives Matter. So, that's all I'm going to say for now, except welcome once again. I look forward to the conversation and I now turn it over to Professor Max Mischler. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And uh, thank you as well to Mio Utsuka for coordinating all the logistics for this event and for helping to make this event possible. Uh, I just wanna say it's very, uh, feel blessed to be part of uh, the community here at the Center for the Study of the United States in part because of uh, the vision of our director, Nick, and a sort of uh, commitment to having conversations and doing events around questions of racial justice um, and, and connecting the work we do with scholars and academics uh, to the real world. So good afternoon, everyone. I want to start by acknowledging that the sacred land on which we operate has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Patoon First Nations the Seneca, the Mississauga of the Credit River, and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It's marked by a history of settler colonialism and genocide, as well as resistance. And it is a site from which ongoing internal and external colonial projects are launched and extended, even as their uh, persistence and violence is erased in dominant accounts of history, especially accounts of the present day. The territory was subject of the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force, or otherwise, as a result of settler colonialism and imperialism. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding those agreements. And we are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. So thank you for joining us today to discuss defunding the police, rethinking public safety so that Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a radical statement. It's a philosophical, economic, and epistemic as much as it is a cr political critique. Black Lives Matter is easily spoken, but not so easily achieved. And this perhaps is what makes it revolutionary. For if we are, if we are to ensure that Black Lives Matter, the world must, must be made anew. One does not simply think new worlds into existence, however. Power concedes nothing without struggle, 
and we must all fight to fashion new, more just worlds out of the wreckage of our present. This virtual forum, and I wanna be clear here, this virtual forum is no substitute for direct action. Nevertheless, we hope that this event contributes to a wider conversation about the history of racial capitalism and its carceral dimensions that can inform all of our political engagements. On May 25th, 2020, Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd. Cell phone footage of this public lynching sparked protests in Minneapolis that quickly spread to hundreds of cities and towns across the nation and around the globe. The righteous anger of activists has been met with tear gas, batons, rubber bullets, and in some cases, live ammunition. And I should add that in addition to state violence, there's also a rise in private, what we might call vigilante violence in response to Black Lives Matter activism. Uh, neither peaceful protesters nor journalists have found themselves immune from state violence. And this political crisis has provoked a global reckoning with anti-Black racism and the failure of liberal, quote unquote, police reform. Protesters have instead amplified radical demands to defund, or in some cases, to abolish police departments, which they argue are fundamentally irreformable. Legislators are now taking seriously demands that even a year ago seemed utopian. On June 12, 2020, for example, the Minneapolis City Council voted unanimously, unanimously to disband the city's police department and replace it with, community -led, with a community-led safety model. Municipal leaders across North America, US and Canada, have proposed slashing police budgets and substituting social workers for police officers as first responders in cases involving mental health and potentially deviant but non-criminal behavior. And Toronto too calls to defund the police or to detask the police have gained traction. These efforts reflect a growing belief and awareness that we cannot continue to fund militarized police departments, underfund social services, and expect to solve the problems of racial inequality and police brutality. The slow death of social abandonment, Ruth Wilson Gilmore reminds us, is intimately connected to overt acts of state violence. And this forum takes up the question of what exactly it might mean to, quote, defund the police, and how prioritizing other needs in municipal, provincial, or state, and federal budgets might help us to actually realize the slogan, Black Lives Matter. We explicitly chose to center one of the demands that has emerged from the Black Lives Matter movement during this long hot summer. Our four panelists today are exactly who I wanted to help us think through this question. Uh, I wanna briefly introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Uh, they will each speak for about seven minutes and then uh, we'll have a short conversation amongst the presenters uh, before opening it up to questions uh, from the audience. And, and these bios are, are short, uh, but all of these folks uh, have uh, extensive CVs and, and tons of awards and acknowledgements. Uh, so I encourage you to look, uh, look up their work and please, for the love of God, uh, these people have written really important books, uh, especially compared with some of the other stuff that's being hawked uh, today to deal with these questions. So I encourage you to buy these books if you wanna get a deeper sense of what they're talking about. So our first speaker will be uh, Professor Dexter Boyson. He's the Dean and Professor of Social Work at the Factor Interwash School of Social Work at the University of Toronto, where he also holds the Sandra Rotman Chair in Social Work. Professor Boisin is the author of America the Beautiful and Violent, Black Youth and Neighborhood Trauma in Chicago, published with Columbia University Press. Um, and I should note that Professor Boisin has an important engagement uh, at one o'clock, so he will be stepping out of our forum a little bit early, uh, uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, next speaker will be Jalili Kohler Hausman, Associate Professor in the Department of History at Cornell University. She is the author of Getting Tough, Welfare and Imprisonment in 1970s America, published with Princeton University Press in 2017. Uh, next we have Robin Maynard, who's a Veneer Scholar and PhD candidate here at the University of Toronto. She is the author of Policing Black Lives, State Violence in Canada from Slavery to the Present. And I just wanted a short shout out because as a newcomer to Canada, Robin's work has been really helpful, not just this book, but other things she's written, and helping me understand the context into which I've, I've arrived. And I've been trying to uh, get her to, to join our conversations for some time, and so I'm very pleased that you're joining us. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Brett Story is assistant professor in the School of Image Arts at Ryerson University. She's the author of Prison Land, Mapping Carceral Power Across Neoliberal America, 
University of Minnesota Press 2019, and also director of, I think the accompanying film is how I, I like to think of it, uh, The Prison in 12 Landscapes, uh, which, which I love this description, I think might help set up the conversation. Uh, she describes the film uh, as a film about the prison from the places we least expect to find it. And I think maybe uh, might a good introduction to the conversation we're gonna have today about funding. Uh, so we'll start with Professor Boysen, thank you. So Max, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm just delighted to share this panel with such a range of, of distinguished colleagues. Um, so, you know, I, I come to this work in full disclosure as a, a social work scholar who's been looking at uh, issues of inequality, police violence, neighborhood violence, and its impact on racialized communities for the past two and a half decades. I also come to this work as a licensed psychotherapist. So I'm, I'm saying all this in order to be very transparent in terms of the frames in which I'm going to be bringing um, uh, to this conversation. And of course, I also come to this work as a, as a black man. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I think about um, Black Lives Matter and whether or not that's a radical statement, I really see that as a human statement, a human statement that has not really been fully accepted or, or recognized. So I, I don't really see it as radical. I see it as, as, as a very sort of humanistic um, humanistic uh, call to action. And, you know, let's put this in context. The United States spends over a hundred billion dollars, that's B, billion dollars on policing every year. In addition to that, 80 million dollars in incarceration, right? So we're talking about huge numbers. And in part, it's African Americans represent less than 14% of the US population but account for more than, much more than 40% of the incarcerated population. And in part, it's because you have communities that are suffering with social disadvantage, and, and all of that is related to poverty, um, being highly policed by police. So you have a regressive tax on the poor. So there are some communities in Chicago um, where almost 70% of black males have had some sort of contact with law enforcement. And it's not because you have higher rates of crime in those neighborhoods, it's because you have a higher rate of policing in those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So individuals are being policed not because of behavior, but because of their place, because of their zip codes. So think about it, the higher rates of policing, you have higher rates of um, police contact because stop and frisk and this whole notion of the broken windows context, the more contact you have with, with, with bad elements in society, the more likely uh, you're, you're likely to uh, disrupt criminal elements. So you have families being fragmented and higher rates of black males being incarcerated, higher rates of family disruption, and again, a higher rate of, of, of cycle of poverty. So on a recent tour um, by PBS in, in 2020, when asked, what is your experience with police officers? Over, um, of all individuals, all Americans said that 35% believe that police treat individuals fairly regardless of race. Now those numbers have shifted slightly from a poll in 2014, where 41% said that they believe that police officers, regardless of race, treated individuals lightly. So, so you've had a slight decline in confidence um, related to the trust of police officers from 2014 to 2020. When we dig a little deeper into that data, we realize that 70% of white Americans feel that all police officers treat individuals fairly or greatly fairly. When you look at blacks, less than 31% feel that they're treated equally by police officers. And I think that's important because when we put it within the context of race and place, we can see how these things play out. In addition to that, when you also think about the whole notion of racial stigma, right, and the demonizing of black and brown bodies, the criminalizing of black and brown bodies, to me, it makes sense. So we could think about incidences like driving while black, Fernando Castile, who was killed um, for a simple stop, uh, traffic, broken taillight, Rashad Brown in Atlanta, uh, who was intoxicated, simple in interaction with the police turned deadly. 
and not after only being shot several times, but then the police officers allegedly putting their, their foot on his neck while he was bleeding, right? So the interactions with white Americans and black Americans is intrinsically different. And it goes back to what James Baldwin talks about, the other America. So white Americans, black Americans experience police interaction very differently based on race and more importantly, also based on class and, and location. So the whole notion around the funding police, they have been calls to reform. We know that the data suggests that this has not been successful. So uh, the eight can't wait, like banning chokeholds, um, that is seen as somewhat of a very progressive policy. Keep in mind that chokeholds were banded in New York State in 1993. Did this, did this not stop uh, Mr. Eric Gardner from being strangled by a chokehold by police officers in 2014? So policies in themselves apparently don't seem to be working right after the George Floyd um, public execution you had police officers in Queens who were still applying chokeholds, mm -hmm. even after you had intense media and public scrutiny, right? So I think this is where this call is coming from in terms of uh, detasking, and I like to use that word, detasking police, right? Um, taking uh, uh, public issues like drug abuse, mental health, homelessness, removing it out of the hands of the police, and putting it into the hands of community workers, social workers who have the, the knowledge in order to treat these things. I think insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And once we weaponize police officers, we give them handcuffs, tear gas, tasers, uh, high powered rifles, that's what they're going to use to deal with these issues, right? We militarize the police and then we expect a different outcome when they're dealing with mental health, substance abuse, homelessness, to me, this is the classic definition of insanity. Police officers very often will say that they don't have the technical knowledge for dealing with mental health, for dealing with homelessness. This is not what they are trained to do. So in my mind, detasking police and putting those tasks into the hands of professionals that are better trained, it's more likely to have positive outcome particularly for communities of color. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. All right, uh, next up, Jalili. Okay, um, I've, there might, they might be turning off my camera during my speech because my internet is, during my comments, because my internet is, I guess, not behaving well. So I want to start by thanking Max for inviting me to be part of this conversation and all the work I know went into planning this uh it's really an it's really an honor to be on this panel i'm uh, we truly admire and I'm aware of the work of all my all of my co-panelists and so it's i mean i i feel really honored this is a terrifying um astonishing breathtaking sort of astonishing historical moment and it's just it's just so critical that any part um that that i can play or the historians can play in engaging this discussion um, is is amazing and again like I said an honor. So uh, we were asked to reflect on this question of defunding the police and I've been trying to think a lot about what a historian can contribute like most help helpfully to that discussion and the first thing that comes to my mind is that actually this demand is a profoundly historically self-conscious demand in some ways. Um, now defund the police is an interesting demand because it's quite elastic. It could mean defunding police departments 1%. It could be complete abolition of police departments. And I think that's one of the reasons the, uh, the demand is, it, you know, has some, has some salience right now, but it's also a particular, it could be a liability also that I think might be worth, maybe we'll talk about that uh, as, we, as we move on. But no matter how you interpret it, I think it's an argument um, or a demand for a historical rupture, for a break with this cycle of violence and reform that has really shot through all of police history. Um, the constant response to police killing with impunity with the sort of the, the same menu of police reforms that have not only not ended police abuse, um, but have actually seek to legitimize, often actually legitimize the institution in various ways. Um, I'm not gonna speak much more about that because I think so many people have made 
that point really eloquently, but I'm imagining it's something we'll continue uh, to talk about. But, but it is, there is a something in this call for an end. By defending the police, it's sort of an end, a refusal to continue to engage in that sort of Ferris wheel, that merry-go-round of violence and, and reform. Um, the other thing that I was thinking about, see, I, I study, or my the first book that I uh, wrote was about the 1970s and about this period when the, um, in the United States, there was a real acceleration in funding and police um, and prisons. And I was thinking maybe it would be helpful to reflect, reflect briefly about what the project of funding the police did, what political work that accomplished. And then by contrast, that might actually be an interesting way um, to think about the project of defunding the police. Now, funding police and prisons has always been about, I would argue, more than just hiring new police officers and giving old police officers new technology and gadgetry and pushing more human beings into police, I mean, into prisons and jails. Um, th this is obviously the most urgent, materially and relevant dimension to what funding the police does. I'm not trying to belittle that, but I want to pull back a little bit and insist that funding the police is also part of an ongoing ideological struggle to make sense of society, to define the problems that we face and establish the sort of range of debates for, pos for possible solutions. So in other words, the political project of funding police was and remains critical to shaping common sense about the world we inhabit, what threatens it, what makes it safe, and what makes people free. And I, and I realize that sounds a little abstract, but I'm, and I, and I'm not going to give historical examples because I want to move quickly, but I can if people are interested. But I think we see an explicit example of this happening right now as we speak in Trump sends federal officers to, to Portland to deal with, to, to deal with the, the, the uprisings there. That is, it's, it's obviously causing incredible repression in Portland, but beyond that, it's making an argument about what's happening. It's, it's broadcasting an argument about what's happening. It's equating protest with crime. It's cr making an argument about the impotence or the impossibility of state and local officials to, 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 to handle it. So it's an argument about federal power. It's an argument about the inevitability of, of military, quasi-militaristic force, that that's the only answer to, to handle in a, like instability and a, and a total refusal and denial, a sort of announcement of the sort of inevitable failure of engaging seriously with protesters' demands. That that would be sort of a weak, counterintuitive, almost futile uh, um, project. So it's making meaning in addition to what it's actually doing on the ground. So if police are the answer, then the problem is crime. And that is what funding the police for that, that's what making a political campaign of funding the police really um, focuses on. So, and when the problem is crime, we are instantly limiting our debate to questions of individual law breaking, individual, um, the individual communities, um, communities of color that where crime is imagined to be generating from, and the state's definition of harm. The powerful thing about crime as a category is the state totally controls what is crime. Um, but in the 1960s and 70s, um, the, the, the problem of crime and the answer of police was neither inevitable nor um, it, like absolutely in any way agreed on. Um, the social movements, particularly black freedom movements, were an open revolt against the logic that was implied in calls for police. They were in revolt and absolutely refusing um, a, a logic that explained racial inequality or violence as the logic of individual failings, of racial difference, or of a culture of poverty. Uh, activists, of course, indicted capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, white supremacy, patriarchy, hetero heteronormativity, all things I'm sure we will discuss today. Um, but what funding the police did was an, it was an endeavor to organize these debates, with, to answer many of these critiques with an insistence that only masculinist, militaristic state authority was equipped to establish order in, in these spaces. Always in the same breath for calls to fund police was a claim that social welfare programs or guaranteed income or a jobs guarantee or radical redistribution of resources were not only not viable and not, in, not appropriate responses to conditions in society, but were actually counterproductive. The claim that, that social, any sort of, even really like, I mean, what I consider very paltry social welfare grants, for instance, were considered pathological, cryogenic, things that made, that, that increased dependence. So these things were twinned and they were, they were connected from the onset. The refusal of, of a whole host of, of claims and the, and the um, so 
so I know I'm wrapping up, but I just want to insist that that what I'm doing is not a sophisticated, I wish I was doing a sophisticated literary analysis or like uncovering deep buried discourse that was sort of, you know, like mountains deep in symbols in the political, political rhetoric. It is not. This is explicitly what people were saying, that, the, that it, funding for the police was connected to a, 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 an insistence that other visions of security, redistribution, reparations, and repair were not only um, not viable, but I mean, but just compl like completely sort of, I mean, totally unfeasible because the communities that were being targeted could not be governed in any other way. This was the implicit claim, I, I argue, I would argue. Um, of course, millions utterly rejected this logic. Um, and, and, but the state wields both very po powerful lethal and explanatory force. And I think we need to take that seriously. Um, and so, what I'm suggesting is that the political project of funding the police masked and has always masked the refusal, the lack of political will to build an equitable multiracial democracy. Um, so no, I do not think that cutting or even totally eliminating police budgets or prison budgets and putting all of those resources under the control of hyper-police communities would even begin to pay for the repair and reparations um, that are needed uh, and that are due to particularly black communities, and I'm speaking about the United States, but I'm sure I'm excited to hear what people have to say about Canada, um, much more money and even more fundamental redistributions of power and resources will be needed. But I'm not suggesting that we need to abandon the call to defund the police, but simply recognize what is implied in that call. Defunding the police doesn't just mitigate police violence and, 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 and impunity, although obviously that's the most immediate and pressing demand. It has the promise, and I think we need to underscore promise, of undermining a whole scaffolding of toxic, racist logics and political common sense that rationalizes and sustains white supremacy and stark inequality. So thank you very much. And I'm glad I my, seem to be still stable here on my link. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you. thank you so much. All right, uh, Robin. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this discussion. We're part of an incredibly, we're, we're just witnessing an incredibly powerful moment, movement across North America where black led multiracial uprisings are changing the public discourse so quickly, so substantively about certain kinds of common sense logics that is that we need and inevitably must have the police. Uh, and bringing this into question in a time where even six months ago, I would say that the notion that police need to be defunded or abolished was so absent from public discourse that what has, I just want to say that what we're witnessing now is something that's truly historic, is truly expansive, and really stems as a testament to the generations of preceding Black struggle that have prepared us uh, for this moment. So I know that seven minutes is brief, so what I'm going to do today with the time that I have is to talk a little bit about just defunding the police um, in a Canadian context, what it is not, what it should not be, and what it is, and what it, and what it makes possible. So, defunding the police, I would say, at its worst, or stripped of the broader polit political commitments from which it emerges, is a, just a small-scale discussion of reallocating some resources in a time of fiscal austerity, numbers, and budgets. Uh, it's about deputizing other carceral institutions with the powers of policing and shifting some of those away from police. Um, it's about smarter policing and moving to more technology and the lack of presence. This is what I would say is the worst version, the co some of the co-opted versions that come out of what uh, being a defunding police is being resold as in a time where we always need to be, uh, to recognize the kinds of co-optation that are possible. At its best, it is a world building practice it is a transformative practice. It is an expansive set of demands and a set of tactics that are geared towards um, abolition of carceral anti-Black controls uh, and racial capitalism in our society. Um, and I would say a tactic, and of course not the entirety of the project, but again, this is what defunding police, as a, if we think about the broader um, movement from which it is occurring, is, is really asking of us. It is a demand that Black communities, that Indigenous communities, that other people who've been made vulnerable, abandoned by the state, deserve better, deserve life, deserve, uh, deserve to live in conditions that are actually amenable to life. It's a rejection um, of the idea that institutions such as police, such as prisons, uh, and the economic and gender and racialized violence that they uphold are natural 
and the carceral logics that they rely on are natural, are normal, are inevitable. And instead is asking us to reimagine that if we are truly ever going to invoke the words safety, security, that it needs to be radically decoupled from those institutions, uh, which are really being re-understood, have been continually understood by generations of black struggle as violence and is now really something that is expanding more broadly into society. The call to defund police is something that is importantly a rejection of reforms that preserve uh, the institution. So what we can see is that we know at this time that body cameras may serve to document, occasionally perhaps serve to receive some kind of, um, you know, occasionally serve to serve as proof in terms of police killing, but do not re reduce uh, police killings, which are endemic, as we know, uh, across North America. We've seen diversity trainings uh, as a solution that has been brought towards black communities demanding justice, for example, coming out of the Black Action Defense Committee's organizing in the 1980s, coming out of uh, women, racialized women sex workers who've been advocating against uh, uh, the, the way that the police would not in investigate rape, right? And we saw many diversity trainings and all kinds of trainings towards police that as we can see 20 years later, as police killings have massively increased along with police budgets, that diversity training has not been effective, that this is a reform that has in fact uh, extended the reach and the legacy of policing. Um, we, under, we need to understand in the context of a city like Toronto, for example, that something like having more community members, having a black head of police, for example, in Toronto, has not saved any of our lives. If we look to the realities of the recent killing of Regis Kershinsky Paquette, of DeAndre Campbell, that is, this is why it really is a rejection of the kind of reforms that have often been touted as, uh, as safety measures that could, that could perhaps control the police, and instead is really a recognition of the fact that policing itself is violence, is racial violence, is economic violence, is gendered violence. What de where defunding comes from and what it, what it stands as, I would say now, is as an outgrowth of the Black radical tradition of exposing the brutality of racist institutions. If we look to the, the political theorization of incarcerated intellectuals, um, of incarcerated um, Black revolutionary struggle in the 1960s, um, to the black power movement if we look to the creation of critical resistance to thinkers like Angela Davis and presently the movement for black lives uh, Black feminists who've been extremely critical of the way that the state has, and police have never been able to protect black women for example from violence um, the, This is again a it's not although this this call seems novel to many that it really is an outgrowth of broader traditions that have been insisting that policing is violence that policing is it is itself a threat to black communities um, for generations. It's a recognition as well of what policing is in actuality. So if we look to Canada, for example, where the, we know that over $15 billion are allocated uh, to, to policing, to cities like Toronto where over $1 billion of the police budget is allocated to policing, where we've seen this massive expansion, as I noted earlier, of the police budget, as well as, this, uh, as well as the rates of police killings having gone up so drastically in the same uh, 20 years that up to 80% of police calls are responses to things like overdose, uh, suicide, domestic disputes, all of issues which we know uh, adding police to, uh, to the, these kinds of uh, you know, social and economic issues is itself another kind of harm. It's recognizing again that the police were not designed to increase safety for those who are actually vulnerable and facing the most kinds of violence and social abandonment in their society. It's just a way of exacerbating that kind of harm. Importantly, I, I want to add as well that the call to defund, there's always a shorthand for, for, for a broader demand, but I think it's important that if we think about really where a lot of this, the intellectual and political work is coming from, it's not only about budget, it's about reducing um, in many cases with the goal of abolishing not only the budget of police but the power of course which take, which we need to in that case take into place the laws that allow for criminalization if we look to the criminalization of drugs for example if we look to the criminalization of survival-based offenses um, it's also about reducing the scope the locations that policing have gradually crept into in our society so we can see for example a very strong move uh, by groups like Black Lives Matter Toronto, by, by that and and others to reduce police from schools, removing police from pride, removing police from their interactions with uh, CBSA, Canadian Border Services, for example, from referring people to uh, 
CBSA, which would be you know, comparable in some ways to ICE in the United States, allowing for the deportation of people who are policed. Again, so it's decoupling the scope, reducing the size, again, with the goal of minimizing towards, again, abolishing the kind of violence that is allowed by, uh, by policing. Um, I think I'm at time, so I just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take one more minute if that's okay, and then I'll wind it down. I think it's also about um, what it asks of us is to be critical as, you know, Victoria Law and Mary Cabot remind us not only of policing as an institution, but as policing as a practice and understanding as well that anti-black carceral controls are also embedded into a multiplicity of other institutions, such as social work, such as education historically, that it's not only about deputizing other institutions uncritically with the powers to police, to surveil, for example, to remove black children from their homes. Uh, so it really is about, I think, or we need to conceive about it as a challenge to the practice of policing, the policing of black um, indigenous uh, people in particular, um, and also more broadly. Um, I also just want to highlight that this is a massive movement across uh, Canada that to defund, to decriminalize, to demilitarize, de demilitarize to dismantle uh, that we're seeing across the country. I'm putting together a document right now called Building the World We Want uh, that's accumulating so many of the demands that we're seeing across North America uh, that's helping document the legitimacy crisis that the police are facing where we now have a Globe and Mail uh, poll that came out that showed that almost half of Canadians support or somewhat support defunding police in their municipalities, which again is unheard of six months ago, that we have um, already pulled police officers, SROs, out of the Toronto District School Board, the largest school board in Canada. Uh, we now see that same win in Hamilton. We see the pause of the SRO program, the Police and Schools program in Kitchener. Very strong movement to pull police out of schools in Edmonton happening right now, led by Black Lives Matter Edmonton and other groups. Um, so just to say that this is, you know, this is a massive uh, movement with people that are young, that are, uh, that is black led, but that is also multiracial, that is actually not only challenging the kinds of policing that we see that is so violent, that is so harmful towards our communities, but is also trying to build the conditions for uh, black peoples to be safe, for the presence of, uh, uh, of safety and not only the, this, this absence. So about this, the shift uh, from funding away from police towards communities, I would say, as Julie Lee, I think, highlighted, is only one step towards what it would actually take for our communities to be safe in public spaces, to have access to decent transit, to really uh, challenge the racial, the vast racial inequalities and economic inequalities that have historically been so embedded into our society. But it's one very important tactic towards that broader, uh, that broader step, which is, uh, which is abolition. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, last but certainly not least, uh, Brett, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Max, for organizing this. It's really an honor to uh, get to learn from all of you and to think out loud with you today. Um, and I also regret that it can't be in person. Um, but it is an exciting moment to have these conversations, to keep having them, and to meet each other in the street. Um, so yeah, my work uh, focuses on the um, political economy of the of the prison industrial complex and the the geographies of the carceral state. Um, by which I mean, you know, the state, um, a state that directs its capacity, its capacity as an organizer and a mobilizer of resources towards its most punitive and and um, oppressive um, functions. Um, this work is necessarily capacious. So my my in sort of mapping out how police um, and prisons um, and carceral power generally um, are distributed, um, we learn how the prison industrial complex and 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 the policing component of that um, are indivisible from questions of housing, who who has access to housing, what the quality of that housing is. Um, uh, jobs, extractive industries, uneven development, um, systemic racism, and and how it's organized and where it's embedded. Um, and I think you know, as a result, this work is necessarily capacious. And I think that that's sort of where I want to begin in recognizing what's so spectacular and important and, and seminal about the current um, uprisings in 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 support of defunding the police is that they're also capacious. Um, they recognize that um, that that you know, as as others have said before me, the demand, the call to defund the police is does, is not about just moving a little bit of money out, um, rearranging it, burying it somewhere, but it's about transforming the conditions that um, make 
the 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 idea of police as a kind of catch-all solution to social problems makes sense for some people. Um, and they're they're yeah they're about changing transforming the con the the conditions and the relations of power that um, that make policing both symptomatic and um, and for which police become an enforcer of. So I guess I'll just I'll, I'll make sort of three short um, points that I think intersect with a lot of what's already been said. And really, they're just observations. You know, one is uh, the first is just to recognize, as I said, um, how significant the uprisings that are going on across the United States and Canada and elsewhere around the world are right now. Um, you know, as Robin mentioned, this is a movement of of mostly young but but intergenerational black led but multiracial protesters who have had enough right they've certainly had enough with police racist police brutality and police death at the hands of the police but they've also had enough of the of of um, the the conditions as I mentioned for which police brutality um, serves as symptomatic of. I also think it's really important in, in sort of recognizing how young this movement is and how, how the sort of generation uh, of people that are really out on the streets doing this organizing work right now. I think it's, it's important to recognize that this is a, a generation, um, a few generations of, of activists and newly politicized people who, um, who have lived their entire adult lives in many cases under the sign of austerity, that have in many cases come of age um, in the wake of the 2008 um, financial crisis and have been told or continue to be told that there's no money, right? There's no money for them. There's no money for debt relief. There's no money for free college. There's no jobs. There's no, uh, there's no more, you know, their pensions might not exist. The planet might not exist. And so I think that this is a, a sort of generation of activists that you, you know, in some ways uniquely positioned to point out the hypocrisy of bloated policing budgets. And I think that's a really important, um, uh, you know, entry into what is the way in which this, this movement is actually catching on and starting to make sense for, for a lot of people. You know, the fact that the, the, there's in the city of Toronto a major housing crisis right now, and it's, it's an increasingly unaffordable city, um, at the same time as the police budget has continued to balloon. If you look at municipalities across the continent, you know, police budgets make up a, a majority of the, of the municipal budget. And so this is something we hear activists talking about in the streets saying, you know, this is, um, this is not just hypocrisy, but we know the money's there and we want it back and we want to do something different with it. Um, second, uh, I just want to, again, this is in some ways sort of obvious, but I think it's really important to point out that defunding the police is doable. Um, it's, it's, we can dramatically reduce policing. We can abolish even the police because policing is not and has never been about crime control. Or, you know, even if we want to bracket out the question of crime, who gets to call, um, who gets to categorize something as a crime, the history of policing is rooted in the enforcement of inequality and racialized inequality um, and the re reinforcement of a particular status quo. But even if you even if you believe, you know, that crimes exist or that there is a set of crimes or harms that we really need police for, we should look at what police currently actually do. And the vast majority of calls to police do not pertain to criminal matters. And the vast majority of police energy is not uh, spent resolving resolving even things that are categorically called crimes, but let alone um, uh, ameliorating harms. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think that when we, when we pull back from the idea of crime and start talking as activists are doing um, about, about, about justice and about ensuring safety and about reducing harm and injury, and we recognize that the police is the most funded, well-funded institution um, that our state is currently supporting and mobilizing have no effect, then I think that that's really liberating. I think it liberates us from an obligation or a sense of um, attachment, hopefully a, uh, from a sense of attachment to the police. And I think that that just brings me, that brings me to my third observation, which is just like that this space is being opened up right now to reimagine justice, to reimagine community safety, to reimagine 
you know, what we could do with the resources, both human resources and institutional resources and financial resources, if they were if they were taken out of the hands of the police budgets and reallocated to communities. Um, and what would our commitments to the idea of people being able to live and live better look like? Um, and people are doing that 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 work of sort of taking up this the taking taking back the space of, of imagining justice uh, and doing the work um, of, of proposing ideas for how else that, that money could be spent and how else that, that state capacity could be spent that actually um, not only, you know, uh, um, lessens the, the harms that come directly at the hands of police, but, um, but uh, uh, recognizes safety and, and questions of harm uh, differently. Um, you know, I'm even imagining on a sort of basic level, sort of a reallocation of, of police budget towards housing and thinking about being homeless as a form of, of a, of a form of, of state organized and state um, um, allowed uh, harm and the ways in which we could, you know, we could spend that money housing people and immediately end, a, you know, so much, uh, so much injury and and condition the possibilities for more and greater well-being. So I'll I'll end my thoughts there, and I'm looking forward to being in conversation with everyone. Yeah, I'm wondering if I could respond to that, given that I have like four minutes before I jump I was, off. I was just gonna I was just gonna invite you to do that. Go ahead. Yeah, so I just want to throw some things out there in terms of reframing some of this discussion. You know, the the rise of the police and the militarization of the police in the United States. Um, what has been told to us is that this was related to a problem of crime. And, and, and the data says that that is totally incorrect. So when the police uh, started to increase in the militarization in the 60s and, and 1970s, we have to put that within a political context. This really rose within a political context called the Southern Strategy, which was a, a Republican uh, approach to increase political support among white voters of the South and in part by appealing to racism against African Americans. So this whole notion, crime was actually on the decline as the police force continued to increase in militarization in the United States. So I think this, this notion that policing is related to crime, I think it's a miss, it's a, a false notion. Police is really related to, to the problem of, of poverty and politics in the United States. So this Southern strategy is something that Nixon really popularized. So with the onset of the civil rights movement and the dismantling of Jim Crow, you started having poor whites in the United States becoming really anxious in, in terms of cultural warfare among blacks and whites, were blacks getting undue advantage. So Nixon really sort of capitalized on this by demonizing African-Americans. And it's the same strategy that President Trump is using right now, right? By talking about if you, folks are going to come into their suburbs, they're going to destroy your properties, your property value is going to go down. It's the same southern strategy. So I think it's important to, to really kind of put that in context. The second point I want to make is that what we call crime is socially, politically, and racially constructed. So I think, as, as you said, Brett, if we think about lack of access to housing, that's a form of crime. Lack of access to, to well-funded schools, lack of access to, to healthcare, that's a form of crime. And the over-policing of black communities in the United States, it's not related to crime, it's related to poverty. White communities are not safer because of policing, they are safer because they are better resourced. And I think this whole notion around crime and the misidentification of structural crime or structural violence on, on poor communities is something that gets lost in the equation. And this narrative now gets framed through the lens of, of, of police officers, which I think it's, it's a misstep. I think the other point I want to make too is that this whole notion that I think we need police officers. What that will look like and how we imagine that, I think it's an important and conversation to have, but we can look at Camden, New Jersey, that dismantled their police department and then reimagined it, right, in terms of getting rid of the police unions, which was very much an impediment to 
holding police officers accountable and the whole notion of increased impunity. And they reimagined that in terms of community policing models. So I would say that there is a, a place for, for safety officers in society. What that looks like has to be reimagined based on the location because one model isn't going to fit everyone. Black men, black men, black individuals are six times more likely to be murdered by police compared to their white counterparts. So we have to think about what that policing model will look like based on location, based on place, and based on structural factors such as poverty, inequality, lack of access to, 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 to health care, and all these things which are a form of, of public crime. Right? Um, I also want to just raise one quick point before I jump off. Very often, as a counter narrative to the Black Lives Matter movement, you have individuals saying, well, if Black lives really matter, why is it so many Black people are killing other Black people? Why is it that there are so high rates of Black and Black crime? And I think that sort of argument distracts from the primary question, which is this that if a black person murders someone in the United States, they're held to the full account of the law. If a white person murders someone in the United States, they're held to a different standard. So we could think about George Zimmerman in, in Florida. We can think about um, you know, all the other cases in terms of folks evoking, again, fear, of black and brown individuals in terms of saying, I was scared for my life. And then the notion that the police are held to a totally different standard, which in many cases is no standard at all, right? So since Eric Gardner was murdered in 2014, there were about 13 high profile cases of police um, uh, taking away someone's civil rights, taking away their life, right, on videotape. And of those 13, only four were convicted right the rest will the rest were released and i think what is really stunning is that um the young man in in um in chicago who was killed by police laquan mcdonald the police uh his defendants asked for parole he was entitled to 96 years of imprisonment he got 6.9 years right so again, the police, when it comes to black lives, they're held to no standards at all, right? And so I think that's part of the equation to also put that within the context and to also think about what we call as crime and look at structural, structural and acted levels of crime. And the fact that policing has to be different in certain communities because uh, the reform, the reform approaches are not working. And we know from a psychological perspective, you can train someone, but once they're put into a heightened state of, of, of stress or distress, the training goes right out the door. So you can think about the police officers who killed uh, George Floyd. Many of them had de-escalation training just weeks prior, and it didn't work. So thank you. That's my two cents. Thank you so much for inviting me to be on the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to say, uh, I want to maybe ask the panelists, other panelists too, if you want to take, if any of you want to sort of take a second to respond to maybe what some of the other folks have said. Um, and then uh, I may have one or two questions and then we'll move into the Q&A. And I just want to let uh, audience members know that we see the questions on the Q&A and we will get to them in order once we start, once we have a little bit of a conversation. And if you have questions, please uh, enter them in the, in the Q&A icon uh, on, on your screen. So I wonder if any other panelists have anything you want to respond either to maybe Dexter's comments or something else you heard uh, raised by other panelists? Yeah, please. Um, I just wanted to respond to the idea that, I mean, in this conversation where there's such a strong social movement based like community really uprising moment calling to defund the police, really, I think that it's dangerous to reframe that as a claim to, re, to, to a demand to reimagine the police, uh, as our panelist was putting forward, because I think that, that is an, that's an opinion, but it's not really what is being demanded at this moment, where I think that the idea of reimagining the police, of creating extensions of community policing, in fact, actually does serve as another 
reform. So if we think again about that defunding is based in understanding fundamentally policing foundationally as a kind of violence and even community policing as an extension often of the surveillance of black, of black communities, of indigenous communities. I think it's important that what we're seeing really, I would say more broadly in communities is a push not to reimagine police, but to actually reimagine safety, uh, which, in so, which, is, uh, which necessitates and is not only, but necessitates actually the absence of police from so many um, of the situations uh, that is, is imagining the absence of police and the presence of security differently, right? So if we look again to the fact that as I'd mentioned earlier, about up to 80% 80 80 of police responses are related to drugs, to mental health, to suicide. We know that, for example, in the case of mental health, we know that 70% of people killed by police in Canada in the last 20 years are people who are suffering mental health or substance abuse issues. So the fact that we don't need to reimagine what police can do in that condition, we actually need to, we need to immediately create um, another way uh, to support people who are having uh, mental health crises. Um, we already have so many ways to support um, people who are using drugs in our society that are so drastically underfunded, like safe supply, uh, you know, that manage overdose in a way that doesn't actually lead people to die preventable deaths because they're scared to call 911 because the police will arrive, that we have these solutions that we understand already that criminalization is not um, an appropriate response to things like drug, uh, like people using drugs in society, like overdose, uh, like suicide, that this is something that's exacerbated by policing. So it's really about imagining something different than that, not about reimagining what the police could be doing or looking like that in that position, but just actually imagining that we actually have the and, and understanding that we already do have the tools uh, present in the society that we live in to actually help keep people safe in a way that does not um, end people's lives and end them in such an, a racially uneven manner. Um, I think also, you know, even if we look to things like gen like the police response to gender-based violence, if we know that for Indigenous women, for example, in Val d'Or, that the police are the source of uh, racial violence, of sexual violence that's been documented by CBC, uh, as well as, you know, Indigenous women in British Columbia, Black women like Sophia Cook, who were, you know, who were shot by police, that policing and gendered violence, though, it, is, it is not an appropriate response. So it's not about reimagining how the police could serve in that function, but saying, how do we actually meaningfully address the issue of gen gender violence in our society? So I really just did want to push away from the idea, especially at this pivotal time right now, where we're seeing such transformative demands. I think it's a time to be really careful not to accidentally reduce uh, the very expansive nature of, of what is being put forward. Yeah, please, Brent. Yeah, I mean, just to add on to that, I think it's it's precisely for that reason that we also need to be <laughs> and are cognizant of what is so threatening about these movements to the to the status quo and why authorities are gonna push back and push back really hard. I mean, we, we're seeing it in Portland, but we see it here in Toronto, we see, see it all over the place. Um, you know, precisely because as Robin points out, this is a movement that's not just demanding, um, you know, modification, but it's a demanding transformation, not just transformation of, of what uh, we think safety means, but transformation of society, the, the transformation of, of how power is distributed and how wealth is distributed. Um, and I think that is, that's huge, that's exciting, and that's deeply, deeply threatening to those who benefit most from the social order. And they're gonna, they, they're gonna push back and push back hard and push back violently and already are. And so I think, I think we're gonna see that in forms, you know, forms of um, brute authoritarian power and violence, but we're also, we are also seeing that in the reformist movement. And I think we can and should talk about that. We've talked about reforms a little bit, but I think that you know, people have done really, really good work. Um, you know, the group Critical Resistance, Miriam Kaba, many, many others are doing the work of helping us think about what constitutes a sort of reform that enables the status quo to continue, um, that counts as a kind of superficial modification of the police as they are, and what genuinely, you know, what are some genuine practical steps towards, um, uh, you know, abolition. Um, and, you know, I, you know, just to list a few of them, um, you know, when we're, when we're, when we're assessed a set of um, policy measures on the table, we can ask, does it reduce funding to police? Does it challenge the notion that police 
uh, increase safety? Does it reduce the tools, the tactics, the technology police have at their disposal? I mean, giving more money to body cams does not. It increases the tools and it does not change the behavior. Um, uh, does it reduce the scale of policing? Does it, um, does it leave out an especially marginalized part of an affected group, creating new categories of deserving or undeserving? Um, and I, I think we, I think as part of this work, you know, people are doing, but all of us can continue doing that really um, necessary work of assessing what constitutes a kind of, you know, superficial uh, mold changing of the apparat the police apparatus versus, um, you know, concrete steps towards the kind of whole scale transformation that people are really calling for. I, I, just, I just wanted to say, uh, we're going to get to the q and in one second too, but I just wanted to maybe uh, make a point that, that I've been thinking a lot about as, as I've been listening to you guys and, and then raise a question. Um, and it's a genuine question. It's not a rhetorical one. Um, so the point is, and it really, and all of you have touched on it, but Robin, you said something that made, it really made me think about this, was um, rethinking safety, but also being clear that policing, and we can add to that, of course, incarceration, and, and this is not just a political statement, the, the evidence documents it, uh, produces harm. It exacerbates harm and insecurity in communities. But I, I think there's another side to this history that's worth spelling out for folks, and it will relate, I think, to my question. And that is, going back at least to the early 20th century, uh, police departments have been explicitly involved in the production of crime. Not just its, its, it, the use of crime to police, but the production of crime by creating areas in which crime was tolerated, and those areas tended to be black communities. And I'm speaking particularly here about the United States. And if you can think about work by Khalil Muhammad, Condemnation of Blackness makes this point beautifully, right? That it wasn't just police harassment in black communities in urban America, but it was creating black communities as dens of vice where they facilitated crime, which then had to be police. And you can think about that all the way up to the 1970s and that part of what constitutes the ghetto in the 1960s and 70s is that uh, police officers are allowing crime to go on. And the reason I'm raising that is to say it's not just that policing um, um, is harmful, but that police forces have historically been involved in bringing drugs into communities and tolerating all kinds of, of social harm. And I think we should, rem we, should we, need to, we need to take that history seriously uh, when we're when we're reimagining what safety is, right? That that there has never been a moment when police have not played that role to one degree or another. Now related to that though, and here I'm thinking of the work of someone like James Foreman about Washington D.C. And because these communities were produced not only as sites that were seen as criminal, but as sites where real crime existed, according to the people in the community, communities have often sometimes developed not just reformist politics, but one might even say punitive kinds of political coalitions. And so James Foreman works on Washington DC, where of course, following civil rights, it was a African-American led city, African-American city council, African-American police force, and it was one of the drivers of mass incarceration. Uh, other people have done this work on New York and the Rockefeller drug laws. That work is far more uh, problematic in many ways. But my question is this, there seems to be among certain segments of people who are coming to this, to this issue in a new way, a sense that the entire black community, whatever that means, some homogenous mass of black people all think the same thing. And those of us who study the history and those of us who do activism know that that's not true. And even here in Toronto, when you can see uh, news conferences after examples of violence, one of the things people are calling for in addition to an end to police brutality is solving of murders or more police presence, more safety. And I'm wondering what you all make of how do we build a political coalition to challenge policing, to challenge the carceral dimensions, the carceral state, to make a kind of movement that demands um, reallocation of resources and uh, taxation to produce new resources. How do we do that in a context in which it's not clear that everyone's on the same page even in the communities that are most affected. I don't know if that question makes sense, but it's something I think about a lot. I'd love to know what you, what you guys make of that. 
Um, that's a, there is a lot there. I'll take a quick stab and I'll be interested to hear what other people think. But I, I actually write, write about the 70s in New York and the Rockefeller drug laws. So I have struggled with this. There's no question that police were totally responsible for, um, for the, uh, the intense the intenseness of the open air drug markets that it were in many communities of color during that period and that the community members, even people who were maybe calling for better policing understood the police as implicated not only in the corralling of drug markets, but actually in the drug trade itself. And there was just no question there was um, not only was I mean, and, the, and, and that actually goes into something else that we probably should gesture to which is there's really kind of international dimensions to these to these things that the drugs in in um, the United States was also, we all, this also implicates colonial projects abroad. The, the reason that there was, I mean, one of the reasons that drugs, ways that drugs were entering into the country, obviously, was because of Cold War alliances that, facil that facilitated that, that the U.S. was deeply implicated in and tolerated. So, um, so not only is it police involved in, in, in the drug trade, but actually the entire nation and foreign policy was involved in the drug trade, which then it, it, it its end point is handled um, as an individualized criminal, you know, criminal problem, right? As, as opposed to recognizing these like vast webs of responsibility that are so far beyond a person who's, you know, involved in a drug trade on a corner, um, you know, in Harlem. So, so, so what I think this builds on Robin and Brett's point, which is when, when we're talking about these things in terms of the police, we inherently fall into this it's like you can't help but fall into this into the pattern of being talking about it in terms of like individual confrontations where an individual state agent goes in and handle like safety is understood as individual you know bad actors or as as having to address individual bad actors and it short circuits conversations about structure about economic structures about what's happening in communities why people would want to sell drugs um, why people would want to take drugs, why people, you know, and, and why there are drugs in the, why there are drug markets in the first place, why are they, why is there a massive influx of cocaine in a certain period in U.S. history, like it has a vast, it has a lot to do with, with U.S. adventures overseas. So I'm trying to sort of point to the way that, that, that a conversation of, about, or a sort of emphasis on policing inherently short circuits or straight jackets are understandings of safety, which I think is something that everyone has, has been saying. Um, to your broader point about, I think it's critical that we, that people don't expect that everyone is, um, all, all, all Americans, all white people, all African Americans, all indigenous people think with one mind or have one idea about, about policing. Um, and I think that's really, that's really critical. I do think one thing that I want to be emph emphatic about because I think it's a really important point and I, it's, it's a dangerous politics. There's a tendency for people to say um, that, okay, you know, it's, I'll just use the example of the 1970s and, 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 and the heroin um, crisis in the 1970s, crisis is a politically loaded term, but um, there were definitely people calling for intent, for more responsive policing um, within African-American communities in Harlem, that existed. But one thing that I think is really critical, and this is where, this is where there's some really violent sort of politics that happen, is that people's allied. There's there's something about law and order politics that, when it's you know in Nixon's hands and in a in, in a bunch of people's hands, that is in that that basically says we need police because because jobs, because social programs, because social investment, because all of those things are, um, are, will, are, are indulgent, make crime worse, make people work. It's basically this, like, we refuse these calls, these different visions of safety, um, and, and policing is the only thing that works, right? Whereas even in the most, quote, punitive, um, I don't even think that's fair, but even, but, but, but the politics of calling for more responsive policing, at least in the histories that I've seen within heavily policed communities, was always a sort of, okay, yes, but what we really need is all of these other things. It was never a sort of in opposite, not never, but it was much less frequently this sort of, um, of a politics of refusal of more of, of broader um, social interventions. It was often the only thing that people thought the state would deliver. <laughs> it was like the only phone call that the state would pick up. Um, and secondly, a sense that it, that it, that there that there had that there was sort of a stopgap in this in the absence of much more um, 
robust demands. I don't know if that helps, but I do think that's an important distinction that sometimes um, gets elided in, in that particular debate. I'm still wondering if Robin or Brett have a thought on that. I'm gonna, I'm gathering a couple of questions. And so I, I'm gonna read off maybe three questions to the panel and then we'll go from there. I don't know, but I don't know if Robin or Brett, if you wanted to, to answer that or not, we can go straight to the questions, it's up to you. I'm happy to hear questions and then kind of incorporate them into some- Sounds good. Robin? Does that work for you, Robin? Um, you sure, want yeah, there's, there, there's a lot I could say to that and I'm happy to incorporate it into the other questions as, as okay. well. Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, and I'm gonna try to go with questions that, that haven't been sort of addressed. Um, one is uh, about police unions. There are a few questions about police unions and how do we, how do we uh, both sort of take stock of the power that police unions have and then how do we overcome that kind of obstruction to meaningful uh, solutions? That's one question that, that's been thrown out here. Um, and another one is sort of, uh, this is specifically about the U.S., but we might think about it more broadly, is what is the kind of relationship between the repression of Black Lives Matter and a broader political repression? Uh, so the question was specifically about the United States, but we might think about the U.S. and Canada. How does state repression of a particular social movement filter into a broader kind of repression? And, and how might we understand that? Uh, you know, what, what do you guys make of that? So let's start with those two questions, um, and then I'll, I'll keep going. Um, I mean, I'm happy to take a, I'm happy to, to, to begin to respond to the role of state repression, particularly of black activism, particularly coming out of, you know, this weekend in Toronto, there was just uh, a, a, an action organized by Black Lives Matter Toronto uh, that included an artistic disruption of several monuments to, uh, to racial violence, including a statue of Hubert Ryerson or Johnny McDonald, um, for example, in which, um, you know, there was very heavy police repression, even though we see, you know, a context in which many of these statues, particularly at, at Ryerson, have been painted purple every year. For example, we saw very heavy handed uh, repression of the protesters. We saw arrests of a few people that had uh, that had attended and also their, you know, really awful police treatment throughout uh, throughout the day that led to, of course, a protest outside of Division 52 that, that went until four in the morning where people were demanding that uh, protesters be released and that that protest went on until people were released. So just to say it's not an abstract idea, the repression of, uh, of this movement is something that's very real, uh, which I can really speak to as somebody that was helping out on the, legal, on the legal support end of that, right? But this is something that's very real. And I think that we need to understand that, of course, we already have the broad, the broad scale policing of black communities, of indigenous communities uh, in their homes, uh, in public spaces, at the park, you know, teenagers walking around in the streets, uh, you know, black people being 30% of the homeless population, for example, in Toronto being heavily policed uh, with, the, with the criminalization of survival-based crimes, of bylaw infractions, sleeping on the bench and things like that, right? So we already are, have uh, policing as a kind of racialized violence, but if we think about, of course, there's a historical evolution of policing as a, as a kind of racial control over black communities uh, as growing out in Canada of the Northwest Mounted Police, which became the RCMP, of quelling indigenous rebellion. But if we understand policing as well as a preservation of the status quo, of the status quo of, that is both that is at once racial and economic um, and gendered injustice, uh, right, then we need to understand that, of course, when there are movements, uh, particularly black led movements, that are challenging that status quo and that particularly are challenging the legitimacy of the institution of policing, that this is something that, you know, the surveillance of black activism in Canada is something that has a long history. The, the police surveillance, that even the attempted deportation of black activists from this country is something with a long history. And that's precisely because of one of the functions of policing. So I would really say that, you know, the arrest that we saw this weekend, for example, there's now a, a strong push to drop the charges, of course, but show us precisely um, why the demand for defunding is needed. For show us precisely what the role of policing is when we see this massive, uh, with, with vast social support movement to end racial injustice and we see the harmful policing of any move towards those changes, then we understand precisely, precisely that policing is an impediment to the kind of transformations that we would need. And I think that's why we need, really need to understand the particularly brutal uh, surveillance and policing of black and indigenous social movements in Canada, which present a challenge to the racial and economic uh, hierarchy and you know, extractive policies uh, more broadly uh, 
in this, in this country, right? That are a challenge to that, that are violently suppressed. And that's because of the historical role and the, and the contemporary role that is actually played by the police. And that's, I think that that makes so clear, just to really reiterate exactly why defunding uh, and moving up and understanding policing as violence is crucial to this time. Maybe I'll jump in on the union question. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, I think that this is such an interesting and important question, this question and recognition of how powerful police unions are. Um, similarly, correctional officers unions are among the strongest um, uh, forces and need to be reckoned as a site of power, reckoned with as a site of power. I mean, you know, I, I think that one, one version of this question that I, I hear a lot in my own discussions with people who self-identify as, as, as activists or as people on the left is like, what do we make of, you know, um, uh, police unions if we are broadly in support of unions in general and consider ourselves as part of a working class movement for justice? And I think it's really important to recognize, first of all, that um, just because they're organized in, a, in an apparatus, um, Police unions are not are no friend of the working class, and they are regressive, reactionary institutions that do harm rather than good for the working class uh, as a whole. And so, for that reason, I don't think that we should have any kind of particular attachment um, or loyalty to them just because they're called unions. And in fact, one of the meaningful things we can do, and, and people have done, is to um, uh, put pressure on the broader umbrella unions that exist to expel the police from their ranks um, out of out of recognition that um, that the police have always um, and by definition been tasked with enforcing inequality and keeping laborers especially racialized laborers extremely exploitable rather than um, increasing their um, their collective power as a whole. Um, but I think that that's, I think the sort of strategic question there also about like how we deal with uh, how powerful these unions are is really important. And, you know, those, those conversations are going on among, among organizers. And I think it's really helpful to think about, you know, in these, in these moments where we're seeing a lot of action directed towards city councils who are responsible for budgets, we can also think of um, broad, broad strategy, you know, multifaceted strategies that include finding creative um, and effective ways to disempower the, the union structure when it comes to the police. Yeah, and just, I mean, one thing that comes to mind that's worth noting is, while the national, I know the United States better, but in, the national unions have been atrocious, really, in their response to this, but the local uh, labor councils, there have been some really interesting examples of local trade union councils throwing out uh, police unions and correctional officers unions from the local council. And so we may see that some of this energy comes from below, not uh, from above. Uh, just two uh, I'm going to try to weave together a couple of questions into, into two questions. So one of them um, is, is really, I think, about uh, the history of structural racism as it relates to policing and defunding the police. And so one question was how to think about defunding the police in relation to a larger uh, demand for reparations. And another question, which I think is related to, to that, is how do we think about policing in relationship to this long, to this history of gentrification of black communities. And that's true in Toronto, it's true in every major city where there's an uh, African-American or, or uh, community of people of African descent. So I'm wondering, how do we think about the demand to defund police in relationship to something like reparations or uh, uh, movements around gentrification? Um, I'm happy to say something about gentrification briefly, because I know we're also running out of time. But I think it's, I think it kind of gets us back to your initial question, Max, as well. If I'm, if I was sort of hearing it correctly, part of your question had to do with um, what, how to deal with attachments to the police, you know, how to form broad coalitions and a mass movement to defund the police when there are, um, there's such a sort of you know, once felt like a real hegemonic consensus, um, and and we're seeing that the hegemony of that consensus really break down at this moment, which is exciting. But I think it's really important to rem remember that there are some people whose lives are improved by the presence of the police, and those people tend to be, um, they tend to be 
white middle and upper class property owners. And so that for me is one link to thinking about gentrification because we see, you know, his, when we historicize the police, um, we can historicize police forces in lots of ways, but certainly in the Canadian context, like the American context, we see transformations in our urban centers at the same time as we see um, the, not just an increase in police budgets, but an increase in categories of crime, um, increase in uh, mechanisms by which police are tasked with in, in enforcing or harassing um, people for a whole set of activities that have very little to do with harm and safety, but have everything to do with um, this, this other trend that's going on, which is the an investment in real estate capital. So cities get more expensive and we at the same time we see greater criminalization of survival activities in the downtown core. And of course that's racialized. Um, and I think that we, I think, you know, part of what's necessary and also hard um, and as part of this reckoning is thinking about, you know, the relationship between whiteness and property regimes and the ways in which police don't protect much, but they do in many cases protect um, real estate values, uh, rising real estate values, and how we're gonna call on people who are, um, who are invested in and, and given advantage by that to relinquish um, those investments and join a broader call for transformation and justice. Anyone wants to jump in, but I have other questions too. Well, you can, if you want to jump in on those, you can. Um, um, I'm happy to jump in there. Please, please. Uh, yeah, I think that I, I, I really appreciate uh, you bringing that up, Brett, because I think it's so important to remember that, uh, of course, there, yes, there is, as I would say, numerically, you know, numerically much smaller, quite minimal uh, percentage of the population, of course, right? That is precisely who the police are are designed to protect and serve not only those people, but the status quo uh, that enables the kind of wealth, uh, you know, wealth extraction uh, and and wealth hoarding that, that that is made possible, right? In this regard, so in that we see, of course, not only support for policing in this way, but also a lack of support for the kinds of things that would actually provide supports for people uh, who who uh, in vulnerable neighborhoods. So if we look to neighborhoods that are being gentrified, not only do we often see support for policing, for example of public parks for removing often like black and indigenous people from uh, public uh, parks, homeless people. But we also see a lack of support for things like safe injection sites, for things like uh, shelters, right? So it's actually not only about supporting, you know, the, the policing, but it's also about, you know, absenting any kind of meaningful supports for people living in those neighborhoods. It's about the devaluation of black people's lives in this way that I think is really um, essential for us to comprehend. So I think that's why thinking about defunding needs to be understood as part of a racial justice project, right? If policing are one of the, one of the primary tools of maintaining racial injustice and racialized violence, then of course, if policing of course is harmful, but it's harmful in a way that's drastically uneven. If black people are 20 times more likely to be killed by the, uh, than white people in Toronto, if the mental health response, you know, only even since the pandemic of Regis Korshinsky Peke, of Chantal Moore and Aisha Hudson, who were two young indigenous women, that uh, it's not only that policing is violence, but it's particularly racially uh, mediated, right? So this idea of time defunding to racial justice, I think that those two things are inherently tied. And I think that's why we're seeing this movement, again, as part of the, the black led multiracial movement that we're seeing in North American streets, that it's, it needs to be understood as inextricable from uh, racial justice. And what that often means is that it is, uh, it's it's scary to those that are deeply invested in a particular status quo uh, and that is often the people that are profiting the most from this so I think we need to think about expanding our coalitions as broadly as possible for people who are committed uh, to ending racial and economic injustice and that assuming that we might not ever necessarily get the okay uh, from those that are deeply committed to wanting to maintain vast economic inequalities I think that that might never be a, an a part of the coalition that, that we get and that that's okay and recognizing who we're working with uh, and, you know, and, who, and who's geared towards building a more transformative future and then who is working against those goals actually. Thank you. I mean, it also reminds me, I, I, this is not my idea. I heard it somewhere from someone far smarter, but I really like it. And that is when we see uh, the execution of George Floyd, when we see the use of force against protesters, when we see state repression, 
it's important to remember that when, when we find ourselves saying, oh, something's not working, this is wrong, we have to step back and sometimes, you know, is it in fact working precisely as it's supposed to be working? And then what are the implications if policing, as we see it on the screen, and that kind of level of violence is precisely what it's supposed to be doing to uphold uh, certain kinds of property regimes, then what are the implications that flow from that? Um, I want to ask, there are a lot of really interesting questions. I'm not going to get to all of them, but there's one that's specifically about Canada that I, that, that I think, uh, Robin, Brett, you guys might be able to answer a little bit better. I certainly don't know. And that is, is there a difference between, or how do we understand the relationship between local police and the RCMP? And are there differences in how those police forces interact with communities and differences in how we might go about challenging uh, 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 their, their operations in Canada? Or is that a distinction not worth making? Um, I mean, I think that if we look at the demands that are coming uh, that are coming across the country from different groups and organizations, we're seeing a tie in, right? We're seeing calls from cities like Toronto, uh, cities like Montreal that are primarily served, uh, that are primarily uh, experiencing the municipal police as a kind of violence uh, that are pushing uh, against, of course, municipal police forces. But also if we're looking to the kinds of protests that we're seeing, for example, in the Yukon happening right now by Black and Indigenous police, sorry, Black and Indigenous people led by um, Indigenous communities like, and writers like Palm Palmiter, for example, we're seeing the, the call to defund police as something that absolutely is inclusive of the RCMP, uh, understanding again the evolution of the RCMP as a particularly anti-Indigenous uh, force in its historical outgrowth and its contemporary. So I think that uh, there is, again, to bring back to what this, what is so expansive about the present moment is it's focusing, of course, on municipal police, but it's also addressing RCMP. It's also addressing CBSA, Canada Border Security, Security Agencies, uh, prisons that it, although much of the focus right now of the demands is around uh, policing in the particular locales that we see, that there is this link between uh, between all of these all of these demands and if you look closely at the demands being iterated for example in Vancouver in Montreal in Edmonton you'll see that uh, quite often that there is uh, that the demand is broad that it includes RCMP that includes municipal policing and that's precisely because of the not identical but quite shared function uh, that is served of these institutions which is surveillance repression brutalization uh, incarceration and that I mean that also makes me think um that a question, a sort of a, a question that, as you say, this kind of capacious demand sort of asks of all of us is to think globally and to think deeply and historically about the intertwined histories of dispossession, settler colonialism, slavery, and, the, and, and, and really, right, that we, we get over this idea that imperialism happened, colonialism happened in its past, but that we're in this moment now um, one question I have that might take us in a different direction, and I know we have to wrap up soon, um, would be about the, the relationship between the sort of movement to remove statues and to rename streets that, that's sweeping uh, uh, North America and Europe, and the relationship between that and, defund the, and, and the defund the police movement. Because as you say, they, they, these are very connected. I want to just, we're running out of time. We have a bunch of questions, but what I, what I think we'll do is I don't want folks to sort of drop off the call haphazardly, is I want to offer you guys a chance to, if there's, there's any sort of last points that you want us to make, or if there's any last questions that you want us to leave here with that we should be pursuing after we leave this conversation, or if you really want to get us in trouble. Uh, what actions, what organizations should we be engaging with? What events uh, should we be doing um, to, to kind of, t if this is a question that concerns us, and hopefully it should, what, what, what do we do? How do we learn? What questions do we ask and how do we take part, right? CLR James once said, the most important question in life is whether to take part or not. And I think we're in a moment like that. So I just wanted to give you guys a chance to sort of lead, have the final word. You can talk about whatever you want. It doesn't have to answer those questions, but those are just the ones that, that I was thinking about. And then I think we'll, we'll wrap up. And for those of you who uh, we didn't get your question asked, I, I apologize. We'll get there. Hopefully we'll, we'll do uh, have a session a little bit more time next time. Um, but we will continue the conversation. So I'll just uh, let you guys have maybe a minute to, to offer us any final words before we wrap up.
Can I just add something here to the people who did have questions that didn't get answered? Thank you so much for all of your input and the fact that we couldn't get to all of them is very frustrating. When we schedule the next event, we're going to try to look into doing something that is more of a community conversation and to give you guys more time to speak to each other and to the experts. Uh, so thank you for your patience and please bear that in mind in the future. So I'll just go very quickly because I think that so much of, has already been said that I want to just endorse and co-sign, but I think that this is just such an amazing moment. And I think that the only thing that I can say is that I just think it's time to really be as completely bold and audacious as we can be in our in our visions um, and and in our sort of in our in our hearing and so and in our action. So learning and listening to people, the people who are on the front lines, who uh, um, who are making these demands and doing what can be uh, and doing whatever can, can be done to support these movements, um, being part of these movements, I think is the thing that comes to, to my mind. But I'm just wanted to take as little time as possible. Um, and move on to the other folks on the call. Yeah, I'll try and say something really brief also just, um, you know, echoing that and and also recognizing, you know, when having these conversations um, with people, um, recognizing what might be for some people really scary about the idea of a world without police. Um, and I feel like part of that work includes recognizing that fear and insecurity exist, right? Um, and the desire for safety is real and legitimate and needs to be needs to be met. Um, and I've been thinking about this in particular during the pandemic. Um, and I wanted to give a, a sort of special shout out to a, an initiative by a couple of activist scholars called it's a website called Policing the Pandemic, where they're sort of mapping how people who are legitimately sort of afraid for various reasons, because there's a, you know there's a pandemic in the, the world, um, are are kind of channeling their inner cops and um, and calling real cops and activating you know snitch lines and so forth, and um, and I, I just think that that's like a really useful way to think about like not just not to discount the fact that people have real fear and real insecurity, but to ask questions about where that fear gets. Um, directed and how we deputize our insecurity to the sort of policing functions of, of the state and of our own inclinations. Great. Um, well, I, the last things I would say is to, first of all, just echo that sentiment. Uh, to paraphrase Mariam Kaba, uh, we're not abandoning our communities to violence, right? That this is a push about actually meaningfully addressing violence, meaningfully addressing harm, realizing that our communities have actually already been abandoned to violence, uh, you know, by state abandonment and the policing has only been just a way of actually exacerbating that violence. So it's not about abandoning the idea of safety. It's about actually really finally actually creating the conditions for people to be safe, to end harm in our society. More broadly, I would just say that this is a time uh, where so many different people, People from many different walks of life who often didn't see themselves as connected to anti-policing movements are being very active. So we see really massive support, for example, for doctors for defunding uh, in, in Toronto and Ontario, which, which is medical practitioners supporting uh, demands to defund the police. We see this in terms of unions that are coming out now and the public and other kinds of associations in support of demands, uh, for example, of groups like Black Lives Matter Toronto, of other groups. So we're seeing that it's possible for anybody who really at this time wants to be part of this struggle in whatever part of life that you are part of, you're a teacher, you want to get involved in removing police from your school district. And again, that's something you can do. There's so much uh, available at this time that I think there's never been more possibilities of thousands of things that we could do uh, with our time. For example, I helped put together a website called defundthepolice.org and it highlights a lot of the actions that are happening across the country. Uh, and across North America broadly that I think is something that's really valuable uh, as well, just that self-education and plugging into the very many kinds of uh, defunding things that are happening right now. I just finally want to say that because of the arrest that happened uh, this weekend, if anybody is able to, uh, in any public way, push the Crown to drop the charges against the people that were arrested at the Black Lives Matter protest this weekend, that again, of course, was in support of defunding, that supporting people who are on the front lines of uh, fighting a, 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 of this struggle is something that's essential. If, again, if we want to commit ourselves to safety, to security, to a world free from violence, that we also need to really protect people who are putting their bodies on the line uh, to bring us closer to that goal. 
Thank you so much. I just want to say again, thank you to all of you for, for joining this conversation, for teaching us, for the work that you've done in your books and the work that you do that doesn't get as much shine in the university setting, which I know you all are doing with activists on the ground. And uh, thank you for that as well. Um, and to the audience, thank you for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you at uh, the next event that we're going to be putting together um, um, to really keep talking about these issues um, with an eye towards changing things. So thanks very much and have a good day. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your time and your expertise. Very grateful.